What's going on ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael and welcome to Fudge Muppet. Daedric Princes are a cornerstone of the Elder Scrolls lore, and if you think about the Elder Scrolls universe without them, it becomes far less interesting. Their varying spheres of influence, their ambitious plans and nefarious dealings with mortals make for some of the most unforgettable experiences, usually with unforgettable rewards too. But today it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. From the creators of Skyrim vs Oblivion, The Thieves Guild, I'm proud to present our next installment, Skyrim vs Oblivion The Daedric Prince Quests. With Oblivion being my first Elder Scrolls game, I will be as self-aware as I can be to ensure my nostalgia goggles are completely off. But remember, it's still a subjective video. Now for some rules and considerations. Firstly, Jigalag won't be involved, because he's not in Skyrim at all. Secondly, we're not counting DLC, but you'll eventually realize this doesn't change anything. Finally, we're not counting Mehrun's Dagon or Nocturnal. Dagon was part of Oblivion's main story, but he had no Daedric Prince quest of his own, and Nocturnal Eternal's presence was tied entirely to the Thieves' Guild plot in Skyrim. However, even if we did rank them, Nocturnal in Skyrim's Thieves' Guild would easily overshadow the simple quest you do for her in Oblivion, and Dagon's main involvement in Oblivion would easily rank above the museum quest in Skyrim. Thus, the Daedric Princes would cancel each other out by awarding one point to either game. With that said, grab a hold of your soul and get ready for none other than the Queen of Dawn and Dusk, also known as the Rim of All Holes, Azura. After providing Azura with an offering of glow dust at dawn or dusk, she'll task you with a service she promises will hold fame and reward. Many years ago, five of Azura's followers fought against a vampire named Dratic. However, while they succeeded, they became infected. Knowing they'd turn to vampires, they decided it was best to seal themselves away in the vampire's lair. Azura feels sorry for them and wants you to travel to Gutted Mine to end their suffering. I'm not sure why Azura wouldn't just help them get cured before true vampirism took hold, but either way you go do this simple task and get rewarded with Azura's star. She erects five candles in honor of these followers, but overall I think we can cut to the chase and say Skyrim's Azura quest is better. Gutted Mine is a pretty generic mine, and there's no layers to explore with the quest, although I do like the note you find on one of the vampires. Skyrim's quest, as you'd remember, involves a former college wizard, Malin Varen, corrupting Azura's star to put his own soul inside of it, saving himself from death and making him immortal. You not only travel through Illinolta's Deep, a fort much cooler than Gutted Mine, but you also end up traveling inside of the star with the help of a mage named Nelikar to defeat Malin in an epic battle. After this, you get the choice of whether to keep the Black Star or take it back to Azura where you'll get Azura's star and a new follower, an easy win for Skyrim. Boethia, Deceiver of Nations, has a quest in Oblivion with a basic premise, but it's the sheer intimidation factor of the foes you must face that make it awesome. To begin, you must be level 20, and after offering him a Daedra heart, he'll give you the opportunity to take part in his infamous tournament of the Ten Bloods. Boethia says, survive and you will be rewarded. Fail and your soul belongs to me. The reward you get is the Golden Fire Katana Gold Brand, but that's if you don't die first. You go through an opened portal into Oblivion, into his arena. Here you progress through separate gates, each time fighting one-on-one -on -one for a total of nine different opponents, all of which are absolutely loaded with powerful weapons, armor, potions, and magic. It's also really cool that you can loot each enemy, taking all of their high-leveled gear, because remember, you must be level 20 to even do the quest, and for those who don't know, this is a decently high level in Oblivion. Skyrim has a high level requirement and a low morality requirement. You must first prove yourself by betraying a follower, slaying them upon the pillar of sacrifice. The job interview continues with having to fight all of the Boethia cultists to the death, after which Boethia reanimates a corpse to speak through, asking you to assassinate her current champion. You were told to travel to Knife Point Ridge, to slay his followers and kill him in the coldest of blood, without giving him the dignity of defending himself. Your reward is the the Ebony Mail, which is incredibly cool with its unique shadowy poison effect. Boethia is a little more cartoonishly evil than I'd like in Skyrim, but overall there's more quality there, so Skyrim wins this one for me. The next contest is between the quests of Clavicus Vile, both of which are quite similar in design. Will you follow the advice of Barbus or give Vile what he wants? In Skyrim, Vile is reached by fighting through some of his vampire followers, which you're led to by Barbus, the dog the Falkreath guards won't quit asking you about. Clavicus File tasks you with slaying Sebastian Lort, a powerful wizard in possession.
possession of the Rueful Axe, given to him by Vile as a cure to his daughter's lycanthropy. A cruel gift, no doubt, but what else would you expect from the Prince of Trickery and Bargains? Sebastian's hideout is pretty small, so there's not much more to do than go in and quickly battle him and take the axe. Vile will let you keep it if you kill Barbus, or you can spare him and get the mask of Clavicus Vile instead. In Oblivion, you have to fight a much more memorable foe, and the weapon you can get is a lot better too. You're tasked with retrieving what I think is the coolest Daedric artifact, the sword, Umbra, and Barbus, in the form of a talking dog statue comes with you. He tells you how this will end badly, as it always does, and after asking around at a settlement called Pell's Gate, you learn that a Bosma girl named Lenwen found the sword, and has since gone on a rampage, likely because Umbra was hungry for souls. Going to an alien ruin, you find her donned in a full suit of ebony armor, wielding Umbra, or it's wielding her. Her personality has been consumed by it, and she'll give you a chance to leave peacefully. You can, or you can kill her, but be warned, she's become quite powerful. Barbus will beg you not to give Vile her sword, and if you don't, you can keep it. If you do, he gives you the mask. Overall, the story of Umbra is just so cool, and I find exploring its corrupting nature far more interesting than the Skyrim quest, so this one one goes to Oblivion for me. And now let's move on to Hermaeus Mora, who has one of the coolest shrines in Oblivion, looking like a large blob of far more than just the eyes and tentacles we've all become so familiar with. In Oblivion, you must first pass the ultimate VIP test to start the quest. You have to have completed all 14 of the other Daedric Shrine quests, and you must have at least begun the quest in the main story, where Martin asks you for a Daedric artifact. If you haven't done this, one of his worshippers will simply explain that you are not ready. There are no clues. If you've met the requirements you'll be awoken from your sleep by a mage, Castor Flavus, who tells you of Mora's interest. The quest itself is nothing crazy though. Mora's followers seek to perform a divination, so you must collect one soul of each of the 10 playable races. In return, you receive the Ogmer Infidium, which boosted three skills by 10 points and two attributes as well, which could even be taken beyond 100. The skills and attributes were still chosen for you, grouped into the paths of either Steel, Shadow, or Spirit. In Skyrim, the Ogmer Infidium is similar in effect, as is the quest, which requires you to extract the blood from each elvish race. However, here at Fudge Muppet, we think the Skyrim quest ranks slightly higher due to the cool outpost location, the mysterious Dwemer Cube, and of course Septimus Cygnus, his unique quotes, the idea that maybe there's the heart of a god inside this Dwemer contraption, and his final death. Before harvesting the Elvish blood, you're also sent deep into Blackreach to put the knowledge of an Elder Scroll into a lexicon, which is a super unique experience. Overall, the Oblivion quest is cool, mostly because it's hard to access, but it's not as interesting as the premise in Skyrim. It also shows why we didn't need to consider DLC, as Hermaeus Mora in Skyrim won anyway. Up next, we've got one of the more straightforward and overall fair Daedric Princes, Hercene. In Oblivion, you're sent on a very memorable quest that sounds like it's pulled directly from the mind of a 90s cartoon evil mastermind. Kill the Unicorn. You're sent to Harkane Grove to defeat a unicorn, which is guarded by minotaurs. The unicorn itself, while beautiful, is not to be underestimated. It's decked out with immunity to disease, poison, normal weapons, paralysis, and has 50% resistance to magic. It also reflects 20% of melee damage back at you. After slaying this creature, ripping off its horn, and taking it back to the shrine, Hercene will give you Savior's Hide. As much fun as I had with this one back in 2006, including figuring out how to ride the unicorn around, it cannot match the Skyrim quest, ill met by Moonlight. There's just so much more to it. You get to hear the regretful story of an imprisoned man, Sending, who took Hercene's ring, attempting to control his transformations, but Hercene cursed it, making him turn into a werewolf at the worst times. He recently lost control and killed a little girl, and will task you with a appeasing Hercene by killing the White Stag. You do this, speak to an aspect of Hercene, and end up taking part in a great hunt, where you can kill Sinding, the werewolf who escaped his cell, or join him, turning the chase inside out, slaying the hunters. Either action impresses Hercene, giving you either Savior's hide or Hercene's ring, and a win for Skyrim. The Daedric Prince of the Bloody Oath, Malakath, 
is a Daedric Prince I'd love to learn more about in the next Elder Scrolls game. His fear is the patronage of the spurned and ostracized, and he's a father figure to goblin can and orcs. In Oblivion, he tasks you with freeing a bunch of ogres that a Dunman named Lord Drad supposedly took from him. Investigating the matter will see you either flatter Lord Drad and have him reveal where the ogres are, or anger Lord Drad with disapproval. You'll then have to sweet talk the info from his lady. The mine itself has guards, and it's a fun little stealth mission if you want it to be, but there's nothing too wild here. Free the ogres from their cages and have them run free, maybe even killing some guards on the way out. As a result, you're given Volandrung, a mighty warhammer. To acquire this same artifact in Skyrim, you'll be doing the Cursed Tribe Quest, which gives you a first-person insight into Orcish culture. You see their stronghold, one of their rituals, you hear of their customs, speak with the wise woman, and so on. It is soon revealed that the chief, Yamaz, is weak in the eyes of Malakath and must prove himself. The grove he takes you to in order to slay a giant leader and take his club is really cool. Having a shrine to Malakath and Yamaz asking you to do it for him and then betraying you isn't exactly a surprise, but it suits his character perfectly. If you make him fight alone, you can also witness him being launched into Aetherius by the giant, which is sensational. All of this gives another win to Skyrim in my eyes. It's just so cool to see Orcish culture up close, a culture that Malakath helped create after he was swallowed in the form of Trinomach by Boethia and excreted. Now we come to a Daedric Prince who gives us one of the coolest weapons in all of Skyrim, the Ebony Blade. Of course, we are talking about Mafala, teacher of the secret arts. In Skyrim, Skyrim, you investigate the son of Jarl Balgruf, Nelkir, who has become brooding and violent, and it turns out Mafala has been speaking to him from one of the doors in Dragon's Reach. You're sent to investigate and speak to Mafala, who tells you her power is locked behind the door, and she needs you to release it. Nelkir will tell you Farangar has the key and suggests killing him, which you can do, or just pickpocket the key from him or the Jarl. Use it to open the door, revealing a note not to take the sword and the ebony blade itself. The sword was locked here after it was first put in the Skyforge to be destroyed, only for it to cool the coals. You can grow its power by betraying people with it, but other than that, that's the entire quest. The weapon is so much cooler than the quest, but we're ranking quests here, so let's look at Oblivion. In this quest, Mafala really lives up to her name of the Web Spinner, as she tasks you with manipulating the two families of a village, one Nord, one Dunmar, into all-out war. They live in perfect harmony together, until you interfere by secretly murdering the leaders of each family and planting evidence to frame the other family as the killer. Both families will fall for the scheme, descending upon each other in a wild frenzy until one family is left standing, or whatever's left of it. Mafala truly enjoys what you've done and gives you the ebony blade as a reward. I think we can all agree Oblivion wins this one. Meridia the Lady of Light is up next, and her quest in Oblivion sends you to Howling Cave to kill necromancers who must be stopped from robbing graves for the materials they use to raise undead armies. You go find this cave tucked away east of Skingrad and destroy the necromancers and their abominations. Depending on your level, you may find it a tough battle, but there's nothing really unique about it except for the reward Meridia gives you, the Ring of Khajiiti. This is enchanted with plus 10 to fortifying speed and 35% chameleon, helping you stay hidden. There's not really much of a story here, and I don't think anyone would contest the idea that the Skyrim quest for Meridia is a clear winner by comparison, ignoring the pain of accidentally finding Meridia's beacon outside of the quest. Meridia wants you to put a stop to the necromancer, who has allowed a foul darkness to seep into her temple, defiled her shrine, and trapped lost souls left in the wake of the war to do his bidding. You fight your way through Meridia's temple, following her streams of light beaming between different pedestals, fighting off corrupted shades, and ultimately gaining access to the catacombs. Finally, you make your way to the powerful necromancer, Malkaran, who you must defeat, and after he dies, a shade comes from his body, who must be killed in addition. Meridia then speaks to you, giving you Dawnbreaker and encouraging you to use this awesome sword to purge corruption from every corner of Skyrim. We then arrive at the House of Horrors in Markarth, where Molag Bao brings the place to life, making things float and fly around uncontrollably as his booming voice demands. Weak. He's weak. You're strong. Crush him. No. Kill him. Crush his bones. Tear at his flesh. You will kill. You will kill or you will die. The door is locked, and the Priest of Stendar snaps, taking to you with his mace in the hopes of preserving his life. 
After killing him, Mulagbao beckons you to the basement where you become captured within his spiky shrine. To please him, you must bring a priest of Boethia who has desecrated his favorite mace. You're sent to a Radiant Force 1 location to rescue the priest, who you bring back and bash into submission with a rusty mace until he pledges his soul to the Lord of Domination. You finish him off and get the mace of Molag Bao as a result. It's a cool quest, though I was disappointed how the priest of Boethia is just some old man in black robes. There's nothing particularly Boethia about him at all, and his location being randomly chosen from a list is a bit dull for a Daedric Prince quest. The best part for me with this one is the opening scene when the house comes to life. The Oblivion quest is much smaller, but to me, I'm going to be declaring it the winner under the premise of quality over quantity. In this quest, Moleg Bao has you corrupt an Imperial who has sworn an oath to never raise a weapon against another man again. His name is Melus Petilius. He is an honorable man, a good man, and this disgusts Bao. To bring him to the edge, you will actually have him kill you. After tracking him to his small house, you wait until he is mourning at his wife's grave and then attack. This is the only way to make him break. You'll want to have dropped the mace Molag Bao gave you near him, which he will pick up and use to slay you. Molag Bao uses his power to teleport you back to the shrine and gifts you his infamous mace. Melus will never know the truth. He will only know he broke his oath. Return to him for your own amusement. No, oh, you're dead. I killed you myself. What manner of creature are you? Will I be tormented with your image forever? I just love the creative concept for this quest, a truly unique gem. The Ring of Namira is the reward you get for helping this Daedric Prince in Oblivion and Skyrim. In Skyrim, I'm sure you can all remember how it let you eat corpses to boost health and health regen. In Oblivion, it was very different, reflecting 12% of melee damage and giving you a 10% chance to reflect an incoming spell entirely. But which quest was better? Well, in Oblivion, you need to lower your personality to even speak with Namira, usually done by sculling a bunch of cheap wine. Then you're sent to a small alien ruin where a group of Namira worshippers known as the Forgotten Ones have been overrun by priests of RK. The priests are carrying torches and saying things like, RK, light of lights, cleanse this place of darkness. The Forgotten Ones seem unable to attack the priests due to their torches, saying, the light, it burns, help us kill it, and so on. You save them by using a special spell, Namira's Shroud, on the priests. Their torches disappear and the Forgotten Ones rush them down with a horde of spiked clubs. You're not to kill the priests for them. It's a fun little quest, but compared to Skyrim, it's exactly that, little. In Skyrim, the Taste of Death quest has you investigate the Hall of the Dead for Brother Verilus in Markarth. You hear the eerie voice reach out, trying to seduce you into darker ways, and then meet Yola. Your with clearing out the drug from the cave that leads to an altar of Namira, before going to recruit Brother Verilus, the priest, to be your fresh kill for initiation into the coven. The moment where you walk in and see the dining hall set up with food and drink, including human flesh of course, and discover many well-known citizens of Markarth to be cannibals is quite shocking. Iola charms the priest, has him rest on the altar where you carve him up for the group to devour. Truly filthy, but truly better than Oblivion's quest. We then come to one of the more forgettable Daedric Princes, mainly because Bethesda hasn't explored him a whole lot, Periite. Periite's shrine is really cool in Oblivion, and when you encounter it, you'll notice that all of the followers there are frozen. Periite explains that they foolishly cast a spell in hopes of summoning him, and instead trapped their souls in Oblivion. He sends you into Oblivion to rescue their souls, which involves doing a fairly standard run of a Deadlands-type environment, activating each ethereal individual you track down. This saves their souls, and eventually you go back through a portal Periite opens and find the followers have broken from their stasis. As a reward, you're given Spellbreaker, which has a 30% chance to reflect spells back on your foes. Skyrim's Periite quest has you create powerful incense so that you may speak with the Daedric Prince. As the colors around you deepen, Periite tells you of a monk, or Chendor, who has betrayed him. He was sent to gather afflicted refugees for Periite, but chose to live as their master instead. You go on a massive dungeon, dive through a Dwemer ruin, fighting the afflicted and their caustic spew, going past Dwemer traps and automatons until you make your way to Ochendor, a Bosma wizard who is highly resistant to magic and even teleports in battle. It's an epic fight and a memorable quest, with unique enemy types and of course Spellbreaker as the reward. Skyrim wins this one again.
And now we come to the Daedric Prince of passionate indulgences and hedonistic revelry, Sanguine. His quests in both Oblivion and Skyrim are quite memorable. In Oblivion, the Countess of Castle Leowin has excruciatingly dreary dinner parties, and Sanguine has you add a bit of spice to her somber soul with a lively spell. You don't know what it does, but you must use it on the Countess and her guests. It's an invitation-only party, so you'll need to figure out a way in. When you enter, you cast this stark reality spell on the guests, and things get very chaotic. All of their clothes disappear, and wait a minute, yours have too! You rush out of the naked dinner party from Leowin, having lost all of your gear and gold, resisting arrest, and escape to Sanguine's shrine. You get all of your items back, as well as Sanguine's rose, his Daedric staff. Sounds like a pretty strong contender. But then of course, Skyrim comes in with a classic fan favorite quest. After a drinking contest with the disguised Daedric Prince, you wake up after blacking out, slowly retracing your steps and discovering that you've had one wild night. You've made a mess of the temple in Markarth, fondling the statues of Dabella and blathering about a wedding and a goat. You end up in Rorikstead where you discover you stole Gleda the goat and sold her to a giant. You'll need to fix this problem before learning you mentioned paying his older in Whiterun for a wedding ring. Traveling there, she tells you that you still owe her money for it. Absolute ripoff, by the way. And wants it back, or you have to pay 2,000 gold for it. If you go get it, you find out that you actually intended to marry a Hagraven who has been waiting for you to return to consummate your love. You then learn of the wedding location, Morvenskar, and fight your way into the fort until you go through a portal to Misty Grove and a party. Your drinking buddy is there too. Turns out he's sanguine, and he's had his fun giving you his staff. It's not just a night to remember, it's a quest to remember, and as much as I love Oblivion's one, Skyrim wins this round. Next up we have none other than the mad god himself, Shea Gorath. In the streets of solitude is a beggar named Dervenin. He simply seems like a madman blabbering about his master. You eventually go to the Pelagius Wing of the Blue Palace, with Pelagius' hip bone of course, passing through cobwebs until you're transported to a realm with Shea Gorath there to greet you. He's sitting at a beautiful dinner with Pelagius III, who is complaining to him. Shea Gorath agrees to come back from his vacation here if you can escape Pelagius' mind, which is where you've actually travelled to. You get given the Wabajack to help you, a stunning addition to the fine clothes you've been magically dressed in. You go complete the three trials, each being a scene representing the inner workings of Pelagius' mind in a unique way. After completing the tasks, you get to keep the Wabajack and leave. It's a cool set piece, but let's look at Oblivion's quest. You're sent to the town of Borderwatch a place home to a heartwarming Khajiit community that Shea Gorath finds very boring. You're going to change that, playing on their superstitions and scaring them with what they call the Kashara Prophecy. There's three parts to what you learn about from their shaman. First, there's the Plague of Vermin. You make this happen by taking an extremely rare cheese wedge, or Roy cheese, from a display case locked with very hard difficulty and placing it in the town cooking pot. Secondly, it states the livestock will fall dead in their fields for no reason, which you achieve by taking rat poison and putting it in the sheep food. Finally, the plague of fear. The shaman refused to explain this, but Shea Gorath handles it, telling you to head to the center of town after you poison the sheep, and recommending you make sure to duck. Right before your eyes, the skies turn red and burning dogs rain down from the heavens, landing on the walkways, the roofs of houses, and traumatizing the residents. Of course, you get Wabajack for helping out with all of this. It's just so fun to secretly do things to drive the town insane, and the canine rain finale is something you just can't forget. Oblivion wins this one, so you can see again why including DLC in our ranking doesn't matter. Oblivion would win anyway. It's enough to give you nightmares, although if you're not shaken by the experience, let me introduce you to our final Daedric Prince on this list, Lady of Nightmares, Vaymina. This was a close one, as the quests in both Skyrim and Oblivion were pretty cool. In Skyrim, you go with a priest of Mara, Aranda, to help solve the nightmare issue plaguing the town, only to find out that he used to be a priest of Vaymina, and fled his temple when orc invaders attacked, releasing a gas that put the orcs to sleep, as well as his friends who he left to die. The temple location is cool too, and as you go through it, the gas, called the Miasma, dissipates, and the orcs and Vaymina worshippers wake up and become hostile. Eventually,
eventually you end up traveling into the memories of a Randor using a special potion called Vaymina's Torpor to enter the Dream Stride. You experience him releasing the Miasma during the Orc invasion and travel to the location where he did so, bypassing a barrier. You bring down the barrier and travel to the bottom of the temple where the barrier to the Daedric Staff artifact, the Skull of Corruption, is located. After you defeat two more priests, former friends of Aranda, you can finally get to the staff. Vaymina tries to convince you that he will turn on you after dispelling its magic barrier, and you can choose to kill him and take it for yourself. If you let him live, you see Vaymina was lying. He destroys the staff and becomes available as a follower. In Oblivion, you offer up a black soul gem and have Vaymina send you to retrieve her orb, which has been stolen from the dreams of her followers by a wizard and taken into the waking world. The power of the orb has taken over the wizard and his tower, merging it with influences from Vaymina's horrific nightmare realm. The fort is full of Daedra and warped sites, including oversized furniture and way too many slain zombies spread all over the place, including on the walls. It was a very cool, creepy quest aesthetically, but overall I'd say Skyrim has to win this one as it has the cool build up with the nightmare's mystery, the character of Arando on his path to redemption, and the contrast to his previous priesthood, and it explores Vaymina more by fleshing out her worship as a bit. The lore regarding the dream stride was also really cool, so it just wins through depth. And now we arrive at the final scores with Skyrim doing far better than I had expected with 10 points versus Oblivion's 4 points. I absolutely love Oblivion so I'm quite surprised and a little disappointed that this is the final verdict I've come to by analysing each quest and trying my best to be as objective as I can be. You'll likely disagree on some of these and I was on the fence about a few but you'd have to disagree on 4 or more of these for Oblivion to actually win. Overall each game has their strengths and weaknesses and I like how in Oblivion it was special how you actually had to find a Daedric Prince and their shrine. They wouldn't just come find you, so it felt really special when you'd see the little shrine marker pop up on your compass. On the other hand, I do think if I had to choose, I prefer how in Skyrim they split it up, with some Daedric Prince quests being given at shrines, with many others being integrated into the world, surprising you when you realize you've been wrapped up in the business of the Daedra. Thank you so much for watching the video all the way through, and feel free to comment what Skyrim versus Oblivion video you want to see next. If you enjoyed this, please do leave a like, and if you want to get more Elder Scrolls content in your life every week, you can subscribe if you're interested. Social media links are in the description. My name is Michael, and I look forward to nerding out with you again very soon.